Right, good evening everybody. Good evening to those who are here in the room with us at Covent Garden, to those who are watching live on YouTube and those who may be watching uh, the recording on YouTube at a later date. Welcome to you all. Um, I'll just make the uh, parish announcements first. If you're watching in the recording, you can zoom on this bit. You don't need to listen. Um, if there is an evacuation, which we're not expecting, and we hope there won't be, uh, it will be live. There's no tests, uh, and just follow uh, the directions of the museum staff who are here with us, uh, but sensibly just also the direction signs uh, to the ways out, and the congregation point is outside on the Covent Garden piazza. Uh, just two forthcoming meetings to mention. Uh, we resume our Acton meetings uh, on a Thursday afternoon, uh, on Thursday week, Thursday the 20th October, uh, when Frank Messenger, uh, formerly of London Underground, uh, will give a talk uh, entitled Tales of the Unexpected, uh, and on that rather cryptic title, uh, it's largely his experience in commissioning and maintaining uh, rolling stock, uh, particularly the 1973 tube stock, uh, but some others too. So uh, it's uh, though if they're unexpected tales, they're tales of um, commissioning tube stock. Uh, that's Tuesday the 20th of October, and then we meet here again on Monday the 14th of November when the museum director, Sam Mullins, uh, will give a talk on the forgotten story of the country carrier, very early rural bus services. Uh, and that's at 6.15 as usual. Right, I think that's all I need to say. I don't, in a way, need to introduce the speaker because she's put her title uh, and her name up there. So welcome to Marion, uh, who is what it says there. I won't repeat it all. Uh, and Marion, I think, in starting her presentation, is going to say a little bit about her background. Uh, so I won't even cover that ground either. I will hand over straight away to Marion. Turn this one up. Good evening, all. Let me just set myself up here. Um, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. It is a uh, pleasure and a privilege to be here on a, a, a Monday afternoon and to talk a bit about kind of the history and what brought us uh, here, where we are today in terms of the underground, in terms of safety. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Marianne Kelly. I'm the head of safety, health, and environment for. The, for London Underground, the Elizabeth Line, and a number of other small teams within uh, TFL. And I joined TFL in 2006, not uh, as a safety professional, but uh, an environment professional. Uh, I joined as London Underground's environment manager, and that was my training and my background. And as I grew into kind of my roles within TFL, I realised that safety isn't the kind of clipboard and the checking and the what you know and the making sure that everybody is doing everything properly. It's far more complex uh, and interesting than that. It looks at problems, it looks at changes, and the idea behind that is responding to that and coming up with new ways of allowing new things happen. There is still some clipboarding, but usually that's on a phone app these days. But the idea behind, as I moved roles within TFL, and I'm currently in, in, my, in this current role for about five years, uh, what it has shown me is how TFL and LU has come together to make sure that we continue to run a safe railway and how we learn from experiences in the past. I've called this talk Evolution and Revolution because there have been times where our approach to safety has evolved slowly, slowly and steadily over times. But some of the incidents that I'll talk about tonight have re really revolutionised what we do, how we do it, uh, and how we think. I've now put the uh, clicker somewhere safely. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the development of the safety framework within the UK, and that picks on some of the incidents on the underground, but also on the history of railways in the UK as well. Some of you here have uh, worked for TFL, I'm sure. Some of you will work for the Underground, and some of you may have been working there at times when some of the, uh, some of the inc during the times of some of the incidents I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, so, if you have any corrections to any of the facts, hold them to later. I'm happy to hear them later on. Uh, they, you will know some of the detail behind this. 
Um, but I will explain a little bit about TF, about the underground uh, in what I touch on tonight. Um, I am focusing on LU uh, and the tube specifically tonight, but many of the lessons learned are more broad than that. In thinking about today's talk, I thought about some of the history and the significant incidents on the railway, both in the UK and, and more broadly. Um, but I've picked on four incidents that I really want to draw out on today, those, who I f those which I feel have really changed how we approach our infrastructure and how we have approached thinking about safety, uh, particularly on the underground. And finally, I'm going to touch on our future ambitions on safety. So I'm going to start by talking about the railways, uh, the safety framework for railways in the UK. You can see from um, left, right to left, the, um, or left to right from your side, you know, the first passenger carrying railways, then the first steam loco, and of course, the first underground railway in uh, almost 160 years ago. During that time, the very first kind of legislative framework which touched on safety was the Regulations of Railway Act, and that touched on some elements about safety, you know, points, um, block systems, brakes. Interestingly, it did touch on the working hours that somebody working on a railway and in a critical role should do. And, and we will come back to that later on. Since then, some of the major kind of frameworks which have set out safety regulation in the UK have been, I'm going to touch on the safety case regulation, um, which is how we would describe how we manage safety on the, the railway network. Um, and in the, past, the way the safety case regulations used to work was that we submitted and we had to demonstrate and be able to prove in detail how we uh, manage safety in the railway. The railway regulator, uh, the HMRI as it was then, the Office of Rail and Road today, would approve our changes and get involved in that detail. But the real change was with the introduction of the railway and other guided transport systems regs which came in uh, in 2006. That changed the accountability in terms of running a safe railway, whether that was the main line, uh, metro systems, light railways, heritage railways. The accountability for managing risk and for managing safety set very firmly with the operator, whoever the duty holder was, whether that's a transport undertaking, a uh, transport operator, an infrastructure manager. Uh, and this is very real for the, the underground, without an approval from the Office of Rail and Road to say your systems set out an appropriate way for managing safety, we don't have a license to operate, to open our stations or to run our trains. And there are other legislation, pieces of legislation which affect how we manage safety in the railway, whether that's the management of health and safety at work regs or whether it's fire legislation. Um, However, I'm not going to talk in much detail on legislation tonight because while it does set the framework, it, legislation has come about often in response to incidents, not as the driver for change. I'm going to talk a bit about how the underground has evolved and changed over the last almost 160 years. Um, I'm going to cover some stats in a minute. The next slide it has plenty of figures because that's interesting. Um, but in thinking about the underground and how it has contributed to how London has developed, and indeed across the UK, it feels a very integral part to the city. It, I could talk about the tube and how it has changed, the rolling stock has changed, the signaling systems have changed, it's become electrified, it's become joined up, um, about how the organisation itself has changed. I suppose when I think about the importance of the underground to London, I think about it in the context of how much of part of the city it's been, um, and sometimes all of the good parts, uh, being part of the Olympics, and such being an integral part of delivering a successful Olympics but also being a part of the bad times and the challenging times. I, uh, for about 10 years I lived, Ballam was my closest tube station and uh, I got to know the station staff very well down there. Uh, and the station manager was very cognizant of the role that Ballam had played during World War II 
when the station act as a, an air shelter, an air raid shelter for many of the people in, um, in the area. He told me that uh, once that Ballon was seen as a, as a higher grade of air raid shelter compared to some of the others. Um, so people used to come from far and near to, to hide out there. And it's incredible when he showed me how people used to uh, take sanctuary there on the track, under the platform, in, in the platform inverts, on the platform itself. Uh, they were very proud and very cognizant of the fact that, proud is the wrong word, very cognizant of the fact that a number, that I think almost 70 people died there during a bombing um, just over 80 years ago. And a couple of years ago, during when it was the 80th anniversary of the bombing of Ballam Tube Station, um, the station manager at the time did a radio broadcast where he read out the name of every single person who had died and invited some of their families. So we've been part of that. The 7-7 the seven, seven bombing, the role that the tube played in helping London recover, not just in the mechanics, but also psychologically as well, that element of not being cowed by terrorists. And of course, most recently during the pandemic, uh, when the pandemic hit and we went straight into lockdown March a couple of years ago, one of the things we knew that the tube still had a really important role to play in making sure that those who needed to get to work could get to work. Nurses, doctors, carers, supermarket workers, cleaners. We knew that there was a lot we didn't know at the start of the pandemic, but we knew we had a role to, do, to play in making sure that London was able to cope and survive and do what it needed during the pandemic. And even today I was reading the uh, ambulance report that I get every morning, which tells me about incidents from the previous day. People come to the tube for help. Uh, yesterday, one of the incidents on our ambulance report was somebody who'd been beaten up outside uh, a station and had come to the tube station because they know that's where they need help. And all of these things talk to me of how the tube is part of London and has helped it both, as I said, in the good elements, the growth, the expansion of London itself, but also during the difficult times. I promised you some facts. Um, uh, and here they are. Luckily, I'm not going to walk through all of them. And I suppose in looking at this, the, a few things I'd pick out are the age of the, the underground, the first underground metro. The reason that's important in the context of safety is our infrastructure in many places is still quite old. I've recently um, been involved in a the inquest into the very sad death of a, a member of public who died at Waterloo Station two years ago. And in looking at how we deal and how we respond to that incident and what changes we can make, the reality is we're dealing with the, a station, a platform environment which was built 110 years ago. So often when people come up with great ideas about how we might be able to do things because they've seen it in Singapore or Hong Kong, um, we don't have the luxury of designing from scratch we're building on infrastructure that was built, as I say, in some cases over 100 years ago. Doesn't mean that we can't challenge ourselves because there is always a risk of saying, the tube's different, do you know, we can't do that because of X, Y, and Z. We always have to be open to that, to seeing what we can do within the confines of, where we're, of our infrastructure. You know, we've got a, a huge number of people and I'll come back to our people in a moment. Um, and of, of course, we've got a really important role. I talked about the role that we play in London, but we also play a role in supporting like, the UK economy uh, and have a role in influencing how things change there. This scale is a, this, some of these figures down here are pre-pandemic. Um, we used to carry over about 5 million passenger journey, passengers every day, um, and hopefully we'll get back to that. Um, we will, I'm fully confident we will, because we are that integral part of, uh, of, of London. Um, and over a billion passengers, I remember it must have been about 12, 13 years ago when we passed carrying a billion passengers in one year. And we had continued to grow every year uh, prior to the pandemic. As well as what we do, we have a huge amount. Uh, running a safe railway is dependent on an awful lot of assets and the people who operate those assets working in a really systematic joined up way. Again, more stats about the number of stations or escalators or trains that we bring into service every day. Um, 
one of the one of the facts appears about like almost 450 escalators. Most of our customer accidents on the underground happen on escalators, and it's really hard to find other people who have figured out how to deal with that challenge because we've got more escalators anywhere than anybody else in the UK. Um, the next person is John Lewis and Waitrose, but of course their escalators are totally different to ours. You go into John Lewis and they've got a long entrance, you know, so you can stand and look around and decide what you're going to buy. When you're on a tube escalator, you're not even interested in the exit. You're thinking of where you're going to as you leave the station. And I suppose one of the things I would draw out is not only do we have this huge asset base, to run a safe railway, and I'll come back and I will touch on our funding situation um, in, in, a, in, a mo in a while, we have to invest in this asset base to make sure that it all joins up. Whether that's our rolling stock, our signalling system, um, renewing our track, maintaining our, our stations, our civils, uh, and we're constantly looking for ways of doing that more efficiently, more effectively, so that we get better quality information which allows us to make sure that where we do spend our money, we spend it and we focus it on those assets which need it most. I put a photograph of uh, some of our colleagues up on the uh, side there because one of the things I've also learned in 16 years working for TFL is that you can have the best assets in the world, but it always comes back down to the people. Whether that's those who are maintaining it, whether it's the people who are working with our customers, that's what makes the system work. Um, and none of the, the elements that I'm going to talk about today, we'll see as, we as I talk through them, the role that people have in influencing um, different, let's call it different ways of thinking, and I'll come back to that more. So I'm going to touch on a number of significant incidents. I've, the ones in blue here are the ones which happened on TFL infrastructure, three on the underground and uh, the terrible accident at Sandilands in 2016. But I've also picked out some other, uh, other incidents which have happened in the UK which have had real influence on our thinking and how we have changed how we've approached safety on the underground. The four I'm going to talk about today are uh, the Moorgate train crash, uh, the King's Cross fire, um, the Clapham Junction train crash and the, the Sandy Lands derailment. And for those of you who've who may have been around when some of those happened. You probably have some insights that um, I don't. Um, but I'll, you know, and I would welcome kind of views and, and, and questions and, and, and conversations afterwards. I will touch a little bit about the background to each of these incidents for those of you who may not be as familiar. Uh, and I'm going to start with the Moorgate uh, train crash. This is, I think this is the most, um, the biggest loss of life on the underground uh, in peacetime ever. And the, there was an independent inquiry into this where a train, uh, a northern city line train came into Moorgate. Moorgate was a terminus station at the time. And the train came into the station. Uh, the reports afterwards were that the train driver was upright, eyes open, looking forward, nothing of concern from passengers who were on the platform at the time, and but drove, came in at full speed and drove straight into the the um, the wall at the end of the platform. The reading the, I read the investigation report into this a few years ago and was looking back at it a last week, uh, and it's incredible in reading it. It really brings home, the inquiry brings home the real impact that this had. Um, the, it took almost 12, oh, 13 hours, I think, to release and to recover all of those who were injured. Uh, so the accident happened at 9 o'clock in the morning and it was 10 o'clock that evening before the last person was take, able to be taken away from the, uh, the station itself. It took four days to recover all the bodies. During the recovery operation, the, the people who were working to recover the bodies uh, at that stage were able to work in the environment for 20 minutes. And then they had to come out of the station for 40 minutes to recover. There was so much dust and grime, and they tried to introduce ways of getting, and it was so hot down there, 
Um, they were trying to introduce ways of cooling the area. None of it worked. But, you know, when you think of that, 20 minutes and then needing 40 minutes to recover before you could go back down again. The driver's cab um, was completely crushed. A driver's cab was, the driver's cab was about three, meter, three feet in length. It was six inches when they got to it. And they never established a reason for this accident. Um, there was no fault of the train. The brakes were working effectively. The dead man's handle was working effectively. Uh, the inquest concluded accidental death. And the independent inquiry concluded that it was a lapse of the train operator. The lessons learned from the Moorgate train crash were very infrastructure based. The inquiry report talked about almost an accident that couldn't have been foreseen and couldn't have been prevented. When I talk shortly, I'll talk about understanding of risk, learning from risk, understanding it, identifying risks that haven't happened yet. The inquiry here did not go into that detail and really did not talk about some of the elements I'll touch on later, culture, behavior. It talked about speeding. Um, as a result, controls were put in place uh, in terms of the speed, so you could only come into a station, a terminus station at, at 10 miles an hour. Introducing systems of controlling the speed um, of trains, so the trip clock system were, and limiting the train so that if the train passed a, a, a trip clock, a, trip, a, a, a speed control system, that it would stop the train. Um, and there were changes in the signaling system, so if there was... Uh, if the train, if the if a signalling system was partially occupied, uh, signals would show as red, uh, rather than yellow as it were previously. But much of the learning of this investigation was really about the infrastructure changes and how you control speed train movement, uh, signalling systems, and it's really interesting as you look back over the understanding of uh, safety, how things have changed. I'm going to move on to the King's Crossfire, and I don't remember Moorgate train accident, but I do remember when the King's, Fri Cro King's Crossfire happened. Um, I'm, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm Irish. I uh, grew up in a small city on the west coast of Ireland, and I remember hearing this on the radio at the time. Now, I had no connection with London, but I remember the, you know, hearing what happened, seeing the pictures in the news, and the, the kind of the impact it had, the severity, the brutality of this fire, having a real impact on me, um, even though I had, as I said, no connection with London. You'll be aware of the, the incident. Uh, 31 people died, hundreds more were injured. And it started from a, you know, a match that was discarded on a wooden escalator. Uh, and initially a small fire, which was being investigated. Uh, and what was different here was how this flashed over and turned into a, you know, a, a fireball that kind of came up the, came up the escalators uh, and into the ticket hall uh, and, and killed almost everybody who was in that ticket hall. It, again, reading the, the Fennel report, um, I was handed a copy of the Fennel report on my first day in TFL. I joined as the environment manager, as I said. But being handed that report on my very first day with the organisation was sent a very clear message. This changed us. This incident completely changed how TFL, well, LU in particular, worked. For a long time, um, King's Cross was almost shorthand within LU for how we do things, because of King's Cross was almost became un, you know, an unquestionable answer for the impact that this incident had on the organisation. And I'm going to come back to corporate memory in a moment because we still look at fire risk um, and give it a lot of detail, attention. But many of our station staff today weren't even born when King's Cross happened. And there's a real importance in making sure that we don't lose an understanding of why things happened and what lessons we have learned from that. The, some of the lessons that we've learned came out of the Fennel report. 
And as I said, I was handed that report to day one. I actually have Olivia's copy, um, her actually hard copy. It's the one hard copy. I've read many incident uh, investigation reports, many public inquiry reports. It's the one that I actually have a hard copy at home uh, because it's an incredibly well written uh, report. Many of you, I'm sure, may, some of you may have read it. It's incredibly clear. Um, it's very easy to read from that perspective. Very clear, very straightforward. And it also has, I think, the, some of the best terms of reference I've ever read for an uh, investigation. Um, I'll see if I can remember them. Um, why, I'm going to have to make sure that I read it because I, I, I'll forget it otherwise. Um, it talked about how did it start? Why was there a flashover? And why did 31 people die? That was the terms of reference from Desmond Fennell. And in reading that report, while it's easy, it's easy and straightforward to read, it's always so incredibly difficult to read. It talks of the experiences and the eyewitness accounts from members of the fire brigade, the police, station staff, and those who were hurt in the incident. It talks about the accounts from police officers who were trying to move people out of the ticket hall and move them to safety. It had eyewitness accounts from the customers who were traveling through King's Cross that day, um, those who tried to escape, so, and, those who were, and some of them were able to, but some of them gave eyewitness accounts of what happened and the loved ones who didn't make it. And reading this report really brings home to you, um, if ever we need it, on the importance of the role that we play in making sure that we run a safe railway. The incident changed safety on the underground in many ways. And I'm going to finish with culture because I think it's probably the thing that did revolutionize how we think uh, and um, act when it comes to safety. It changed fire controls. Um, you know, wooden escalators were phased out, new sprinkler systems put in place, radio systems which made sure that TFLU staff could con communicate effectively with the police the, uh, the fire brigade emergency services. It's become much more, you know, it's very hard for things to burn in a underground station these days. When I think about that, I, a number of years ago, uh, we had issues with the ventilation system on the Jubilee line. And the ventilation system is designed to make sure that if there is a fire on a train, that we can move smoke out of the area so that the fire brigade can effectively respond to the, the fire. And we had a few issues and we had to make a decision about whether we kept uh, a certain number of stations open or closed. And in talking to our engineering team and to our maintenance team, you know, I said, you know, how do I get a fire to burn on, on, a, on a train? You know, what would it take to be you know, on a Jubilee Line train for that fire to go on and for a fire to start to catch and to, to propagate? And the reality now is we have looked at everything within and the materials that we have across the underground to make sure fires can't take. The most likely thing that will burn on an, uh, an underground uh, train or station is the luggage or our bags our customers bring. And that comes, and I, I can see the evidence of that in two particular incidents that spring to mind. Uh, the Parsons Green terrorist attack a number of years ago where you'll remember, some of you might have seen the footage, a, somebody brought and left a, a bomb, left it on the uh, district line train. The bomb went off, filled the, tr the smoke with carriage. But if you look at the video footage of what happened, and we have that from, um, a, I think, a police officer who was there at the time, the train didn't burn. The, the, the flooring, the seats, the material the train's burning on, the fire died out. And equally, uh, last year, well, maybe it was, the year before, it was the year before, the end of 2020, we had two incidents where um, an e-scooter and an uh, e-unicycle e went on fire on the uh, underground network, one within a train. And again, the uh, e-scooter which went on fire uh, exploded, the battery imploded. That did not take in the rest of the fire. It burned, 
there were flames, there was an awful lot of smoke. But the risk to us isn't so much from the fire anymore, it's from how our customers might respond to that and the risk of panic and people fleeing um, what they might see, what they see as a, as a, a risky environment. Um, so that gives me confidence that we are managing in the materials that we use how we manage fire. But we also changed, um, one of the things that came across incredibly strongly from the Fennel uh, report was the lack of training uh, and approach to uh, making sure we were able to, uh, that people knew what to do. Uh, so now we've overhauled kind of competence, training, and we still continue to do that today. We recently overhauled the, last year overhauled our approach to fire safety training and really brought back in the why. Because we're very good often in training people what to do, but that doesn't always last unless you understand why you're doing something. And as I mentioned, many of our station teams weren't even born when the uh, station staff weren't even born when the King's Cross fire happened. So they don't understand the why. When we ask people to check to make sure that the fire control panel is working every day, do they understand the importance of doing that? So we continue to do and learn on that. But we've also changed our um, maintenance activities, how often we inspect, and so on. A big change out of the uh, King's Cross fire was also our um, operational response. We now, you know, every station has an emergency plan, and that emergency plan continues to learn the lessons out of the, the King's Cross fire. Um, Many people who write them today probably don't realise that, but, but that's where that information comes from. And that, those emergency plans make sure that our, those who may be involved in responding to an incident fully understand that, what, what their role and what they do. It covers everything from the training and competence individuals have. If I'm trained to, to I'm licensed to work on a, an LU station, and in doing that, to work on a station, I have to be familiarised before I can work on the station. I cannot just turn up, put on a high vi and start work. And that comes out of the, that is one of the learnings out of the King's Cross fire. Within a station at any given time, a certain proportion of that station staff have to be, have been involved in a recently live evacuation. So we will do tabletop exercises and desktop exercises evacuation, but our subsurface surface stations will ha have a live evacuation at least every six months. Now that's not always easy and you can imagine the pushback sometimes of that. But it's incredibly important to do that so that we practice and make sure that we're always ready for this and we learn lessons out of that. So if on a Sunday afternoon you're ever kicked out of a, a tube station because we're doing a live evacuation, um, you know where some of that has come from. We've also learned, though, in terms of our response with the emergency services, uh, it was really clear that not only did the LU team not really understand how to respond fully to, this, uh, to the fire, the there were challenges with the fire brigade as well, uh, and they weren't able to communicate effectively with us, particularly because the fire in effect divided the station into two. Uh, the police played a great role on that day and they were commended in the final report, but that's not how we should be responding to any sort of incident. That element of um, those sort of events need to be understood and rehearsed. Uh, and one of the recommendations out of the final report was to have joint exercises, exercises that we continue to this day. And we continue that regular liaison with the fire brigade. Uh, I chair a, a quarterly meeting with their senior team where we involve our station team, our uh, engineering team, our maintenance team to make sure we have a joint up approach and where there are issues that may come about in their response to any instance on the underground that we learn from them, and we learn from them rapidly. And the final part I'm going to touch on, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail, is our culture, because this is truly where I think that our approach has, was revolutionized. We, I'll show you some of the quotes from the final report. The underground took as a starting point the inevitability of fires. There are going to be fires. Uh, of course, smoking was, had been banned in the underground three years prior to this, um, but never really enforced. Uh, and there was a kind of belief and understanding and a, an acceptance that there will be fires in the underground, but that we'll manage and respond to them. And that acceptance of risk uh, 
we, it started to, that started to change after um, the King's Cross fire. Not just in terms of fire risk, but in our approach to understanding well, what, are we man what risks are we managing it? How do we manage them? What do we need to think about? One of the things that jumped out to me the first time I read the Fender report and since then often is, and this is a, a direct quote from the, uh, from the report, the, the senior management team did not see passenger safety as part of their job. Now I find that incredible to think of now when it's something that we talk about all the time uh, in, on, in TFL and are always challenged to further improve how we approach this. But there was a real, um, I suppose part of this was, came from the, the structure of the organization at the time. And when I talk about our culture changing, out of this incident, we changed how we thought about safety and, and risk and our customers, but we also changed how we think about an organization and how an organization is run and what that organization is accountable for and what individuals in that organization is accountable for. Because at this day, time, the, we had well, probably classic silo workies or you know, silo working, you know, engineering teams and operations teams and maintenance teams who were all very clear on their accountabilities but never strayed outside of their boundary. And risk is never done within a silo. It's always managed across boundaries. And there aren't many risks that I can think of which don't need input from all of those who are involved. It's also incredible to you know, reflect on the, how inwardly looking the organization was at the time. Uh, the quote here I have talked about, yes, you know, having that real focus on being technical experts meant that we had some of the best technical experts, I was about to say in the country, probably in the world. However, this talked about it being dangerous, blinkered, uh, and that unwillingness to look outside. At this stage, when the organization was recruiting for senior managers, they only ever advertise something like 5% of all senior manager posts externally. Everything else was drawn from inside. One of the uh, senior engineers talked to, in the Fennel report, about honestly, firmly believing, and actually I think the words that is used in the report is, he argued that we would not find better people outside of, t outside of under the underground. And that's why we didn't look anywhere else. Now, it may be that there are technical experts, and that maybe the technical expertise was there, but you don't manage risk by having silos of technical experts. My experience when it comes to good teams that are effective and get things done is you need technical exper experts. You need experience, but you also need fresh eyes because fresh eyes will pick up the things that the technical experts just lose sight of because they become over familiar with it. And out of these three things, this is what really changed um, safety on the underground. And as I said, became a byword for how the organization had changed and how, yes, we changed our escalators over a period of seven or eight years and we changed our fire control systems. But what really changed and what was really uh, different was how we thought about accountability and how we thought about risk um, and how we talk about our customers. Touching on Clapham, um, three trains in Clapham Junction and uh, collided because of an error in the signaling system. The signaling system had been rewired and the technician who had rewired it left uh, some of the uh, some wiring loose um, over I think a period of about two weeks that wiring came into contact with uh, other wires you'll forgive my non-technical on engineering explanation of all of this um, but the result was a, a signal did not return to danger when it should have and resulted in uh, the absolute horrific uh, crash at Clapham 
I talked about how I read, um, not period out of interest, but how I read investigation reports. And one of the things that struck me, and I can't remember where I read it, but it stuck with me at the time, uh, somebody from the fire brigade talking about when they went down to the scene, there were Christmas cards everywhere. Because this was in the 12th of December. People were obviously writing their Christmas cards on the train. And she described it as it being strewn with Christmas cards. A real kind of, again, message of what actually happened. We're not learning theoretical lessons here. We're learning about tragedies that have, uh, well, they're tragedies. They're having impacts on, on, on people's lives, those who died and uh, those who were hurt uh, in the incident. And the lessons that came out of Clapham are lessons that were learned across the, organ, across the, the railway industry uh, and within the tube as well. Signaling systems and this way that we test and monitor, and importantly, when we make changes to the signaling system, that we get an independent inspection of that and say, yeah, that's good to go before we make any changes to the signaling system. But if you get it wrong, it makes, you know, you can have an impact uh, like this. Um, and many of our signaling changes have arisen from this. I touched earlier on some of the earliest legislation uh, relating to railways, touched to working hours. The uh, independent inquiry into this report also touched on, uh, touched on hours. The technician who had made the changes had been working, and let me get this right, it was his 13th week of straight seven day working weeks. Now he maintained he wasn't tired at the time and he may not have been. I'm sure you, you know, some people may be able to do that sort of work and be, remain perfectly rested. But 13 weeks of working seven days a week. And this is when I talk about an evolution and change in our thinking. Um, fatigue is something that we are still learning about many years later and the influence that can have on decision making. And I'll come back to that human intervention in a while because I'll, when I talk about Sandy Lines, I will touch on the use of technology. And technology and automation can make the railway much safer, but we, haven't, we still re rely on people and for a lot of things. And there are still things that people do better than technology, but there are also areas where that introduces a weakness. And we are still, our understanding of uh, fatigue and distraction and alertness remains something that is evolving and developing over time. What was really interesting is the um, Anthony Hidden's report and inquiry into this talked a lot about management of change. And while that was done in the context of managing change associated with uh, signaling changes and how you manage those changes, what is true is this is really the start of understanding how you manage change, how you manage safety risks associated with change. And I look at how we manage change now on the underground and where we make changes, whether those are changes to new, changes to signaling systems, changes to rolling stock, changes to how we physically work, or whether they are changes, softer changes, organization changes, process changes. We now explicitly and have for some time considered what are the safety risks associated with that change. Now that might seem really obvious to many of us that now, but this is the first time people were really starting to think about when you make a change, you need to consider the safety risks associated with that change. One of the other things that I haven't put up here, but that struck me when I was uh, thinking about the Clapham Junction incident again, was uh, Anthony Hidden's inquiry report talked about culture. He was very critical of the health and safety culture at what was British Rail at the time. Um, but it strikes me as we look at, and I look at kind of RAIB incident reports and incident reports today, that culture remains one of the areas which influences how we approach uh, safety and how we run a safe railway um, on, uh, in the underground and, and across the UK. And the final, uh, oh, that didn't work. The final uh, incident that I want to talk about this evening is about Sandylands. This is the one incident that I was working at TFL for, and 
I remember that Wednesday morning, um, I was based in Albany House, the adjunct to 55 Broadway, that some of you will know. And I remember being at my desk when my boss at the time came walking towards me. And, you know, you don't, I, don't, I, I won't forget the, the look on her face that day. And that was really early on when we just had heard it had happened, but knew that it was incredibly serious. And I had worked with the trams team down at uh, Croydon um, in the, the kind of six to eight months before that. So I knew a lot of the operational and the, the safety teams down there. Uh, and was down at Nollis, went down to Nollis House that evening with, to kind of see what support you can offer a team um, at that stage. Um, and there's not a lot you can do. But you, many of you again will, will know the, the, the history of or the kind of what happened on this day. Um, the train from New Adlington going towards Wimbledon came around this uh, this this corner, um, approaching the the St. Julian's Junction, and uh, was going too fast and uh, overturned. Seven people died, hundreds more in hospital. And it it was different. I'll come to the lessons that we've learned out of this, but it it remains. I mean the, the Inquest conclu was concluded in September last year and uh, found, came to a verdict of accidental death. But the Office of Rail and Road are prosecuting the driver, um, train, the Trams Operation Limited, the organisation which runs the tram system, and TFL uh, in, in, in the context of this incident. And what we have learned and taken out of this is builds on some of the, the kind of themes that have started to emerge from some of the other accidents I, or incidents that I referred to. First of all, the understanding of risk. And here we'll see parallels with the, Fennel, Fennel, the King's Cross fire. Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't happen. And it's really kind of help, helped us go back to the basics here in understanding, well, well, how do we think about risk and how do we make sure that there aren't dark corners or things that we have completely missed? How do you keep that fresh pair of eyes so that when you're looking at something that you can still see that risk and you don't become blind to it? Because becoming blind to a risk, it, people will often refer to it as complacency. I, don't, I think complacency is too harsh a word because I don't think people are being complacent in person. I think you just become over familiar and you don't see what's in front of you. A, a total aside, I remember years, when I was growing, growing up, I must have been maybe a teenager at the time, and my, my dad and my uncle decided they needed to fix something in the kitchen. and they, they dug up the tiles and there was a little hole. That hole must have been there for a year and a half and we just stopped seeing it. I mean, it was a hole this size in the corner of the kitchen, but you stop seeing it because you see it every day. And this is why going back to the inwardly looking approach that uh, Desmond Fennell came across is it's so important to have those fresh eyes to bring a new perspective and somebody to say, even just that looks a bit odd, when are you going to fix it? But that element of understanding risk, and this really brought us back to basics, uh, not just on the trams, but in the context of you know how we look at risk across the underground, across TFL, do we really understand you know what the issues are? What are some customers had raised concerns about train, uh, tram operators driving around this corner too quickly. Um, now, one of the things I do every morning is look at the safety complaints by our customers from the previous day. And we keep an active eye on that to make sure that if we start seeing trends of something that's a bit unusual, we actually respond to it. The other thing that came out, and I've touched on this in, in the context of the fatigue and tiredness, is driver alertness and awareness. Many of our, you know, the driver was operating the system, but none of us can stay alert all the time. It's just physically impossible. And how do you maintain in an environment where systems are becoming more automated, um, there's less thinking to do in certain areas, how do you maintain that driver alertness and awareness? And this is something that while it's very specific to this tram crash, it's something that we're really cognizant of in the tube. Many of our train systems now are automated. Train operator goes in, presses two buttons, the train drives itself, 
presses two buttons, the door opens at the next station, and their role is very different. They still have a hugely important role. The train operator is responsible for making sure that we, when we depart a platform, that it is safe to do so. But how do you maintain that concentration when you actually, the bits that used to keep your job interesting and kept you alert, have been removed? The trams team have introduced a, a, a motion, a very sensitive um, system where it takes very mi micro movements in the face. So if a train operator, if it takes potential for distraction or loss of attention, it, the, the cab seat buzzes so that the train operator, the tram operators, uh, come back. And we're trying to learn from some of that as well. And that that brings us to modern technology. And this isn't just about modern tech, use of modern technology in the context of um, uh, alertness and awareness. There's so much more that we can do today with technology. Um, I'll touch in a moment one of the key risks that we continue to look at is the, our colleagues who access the track and how we can use technology to keep them safe. What I think about it, and I was, when I think about technology, though, I think, I think one of the great limiters in that is those of us who have a role to play in implementing and these changes sometimes often don't understand the absolute incredible possibilities of technology. It can do more than sometimes we can think of and how we connect the people who can see what it can do with those who have the power and the influence to, to make those changes. So those are the three, four kind of key incidents I wanted to talk about because they, for me, talk about some of the changes in not only how we've looked at our infrastructure and how we have learned out of that, but more importantly, how we have really have changed how we think and our approach to, to safety um, on the underground. And then I wanted to touch uh, a bit about our ambitions. So our ambition is really simple, really, really simple. Nobody will be killed or seriously injured on the underground. Um, that means customers or colleagues. This is set out in the Mayor's Transport Strategy. By, we have a date, 2041. This is where we want to be. And it sounds really challenging. Those of you who travel on the underground, um, not that I'm worried about big catastrophic events, because we have a lot of systems in place to manage that. Um, this is where I would touch wood if I was pretending to be, um, if I was trying not to be superstitious. Uh, but it's about the nature of how we look at, you know, some of the incidents that I see happening aren't always fully within our gift control. But then, so sometimes this feels really daunting to me. Can we actually achieve it? But when I look at incident reports, and when I look at people who've been killed or seriously injured on the underground, whether that's a customer or a colleague, they're all preventable. All of those accidents are preventable. And believing that is why I think that this is achievable. And I'm going to touch very briefly on both customer and colleagues and how we're tackling that to get us towards this ambition. In terms of our customers, 80% um, of all the accidents in the underground happen on escalators, stairs, and uh, as people are boarding and alighting trains. And we have a really key role in making sure that our assets are fit for use and that our colleagues who operate our stations and drive our trains are fully trained, fully competent, understand their accountabilities and understand how they manage risk and how they respond to it. Customer behaviour also has a, a role to play because we know from, we have a lot of data, we know from our accident data that there are some really common contributory factors. People carrying luggage, um, people rushing, uh, and people who are under the influence of alcohol. Those three factors are really common in many of our incidents, in, in many of these, this 80%. But we know we can influence customer behaviour because we have done it in TFL in terms of changing road safety. It is now so much safer to walk, cycle around London than it was 10 years ago. And that's because we're influencing behavior. So with the right thought process and the right design and the right consideration of the network, we can change that. But it also means we have to look at the integrity of our assets and how they come together. Because just because we haven't had a derailment or a collision between trains in some time doesn't mean it's not going to happen again. And it's so important that we continue to look at our assets and how we manage them. Particularly, many of you will be familiar with the fact that TFL is under some significant financial strain at the moment. 
Um, luckily, we've got a funding deal now that'll get us through for uh, the next 18 months. Uh, and I've got to say, those times, we were on funding deals of six days long at, at stages. Uh, but we have a plan, and we work very closely with our regulator. And the regulator recently worked through with us. We went into a, a really a, quite a number of deep dives across our assets, our overall approach to managing our assets, our strategy, our policies, but then really peeling back the onion layers to say, well, what does that mean for signalings? And how are you maintaining, making sure that the Bakerloo line is still safe to operate? And that gives that iterative and collaborative discussion with the regulator helps us refine our thinking and become even better at making sure that we look at our uh, assets. Because, as I said, just because it hasn't happened for a while doesn't mean that it won't happen again. And we're very cognizant of, of that. And in terms of the safety of our colleagues, um, our, until September 2019, it had been a long time since anybody who was working for TfL had been killed while at work. We, uh, one of our contracting colleagues uh, working at Tottenham Court Road, um, outside the station, um, doing some ex excavation work, um, hit a utility, uh, hit a power strike, and died later because of his injuries in May 2008. Prior to that, uh, four members of the track team died the, uh, on the Metropolitan Line back in 1990. But in, in September uh, 2019, one of our contracting colleagues who is working, uh, doing intrusive clean at the Travelator at uh, Waterloo, died as a result of uh, the injury he received while working. And we've learned from that. Uh, we and the, the Escalator and the, the, the Travelator industry in the UK have learned from that. The photograph I have here is a photograph of a memorial plaque that we put up in Waterloo Station uh, on the second anniversary. We still remain in very close contact with his widow and his family, and we unveiled a, a plaque uh, in a small service that the family held on the second anniversary. I passed it this morning as I, as I walked through Waterloo, and it remains that real constant reminder for us of what happened. And in the same way that King's Cross became a, a byword for fire safety, um, Christian Tuvey's name has become a byword for making sure that we don't forget uh, that if we don't manage risk safely and if we don't keep it at the forefront of mind, that this can still happen. The other two examples are, you know, we've learned from the Margam incidents in terms of safe track access. Um, we work very differently to Network Rail, but some of you will remember in July 2019, two members of the Network Rail team who were working on the track died when they were hit by a train. And while we don't work in the same way, members of our staff do access the track to carry out work, um, mainly during engineering hours, but that is a risk that we have to continue to manage. And finally, um, going to culture rather than process. Communication continues to be really important in terms of managing safety. Uh, and out of some serious incidents we had two years ago, we completely overhauled how we approach safety critical comms to change how we manage safety on the underground and how we make sure that where we're dealing with any sort of operation instance, that the right facts are communicated to the right people at the right time. I've just tried to kind of illustrate, um, and somehow the time has run away more quickly than I expected, uh, some of the key kind of the, the key incidents in our history that have influenced how we think and react to, uh, how we think about safety and how we deal with it now. Um, and hopefully um, you found it interesting. But yes, hope, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Marion, very much indeed. <coughs> very comprehensive presentation. There are indeed members of the audience who will have experience of some of the issues you've touched upon and some of the uh, incidents. Uh, could I ask you please to wait for the microphone because that does help people here in the room to hear the question, uh, but also particularly those who are listening now or later on YouTube. So who is going to jump in with the first question? I see a hand in the darkness of the back. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's John Carr in fact. Um, <coughs> congratulations on uh, 
superb run through railway safety. Um, minor, perhaps frivolous quibble, if I may. I think it's unlikely that Stockton and Darlington Railway was the first public passenger carrying railway, or whichever <laughs> way you. <coughs> there was at least the Hedden, Hedden Railway, which carried probably employees only a couple of years earlier in the same area. Interestingly, what the S&D can claim to have was probably the first recorded incident of, incidents of franchising because passengers were, in fact, conveyed in converted stagecoaches running on the rails and they were horse-drawn in between the steam coal trains. But <coughs> coming to your main points... I think there's an interesting contrast <coughs> between the way in which the British Railways Board dealt with Clapham and the way in which TFL, uh, or <coughs> London Transport, as I think it was in those days, uh, dealt with King's Cross. <coughs> I was in London, although I worked in Yorkshire, uh, on the days of both incidents, and <coughs> I remember the horror uh, first of all, at uh, Clapham, which was the later of the two, <coughs> where I was in a meeting in Portland Place, the CILT headquarters, or CIT in those days, <coughs> and the um, chairman of the British Railways Board left immediately for the scene. And King's Cross was far more personal. I passed through the station probably about half an hour before the fire broke out, and members of staff from West Yorkshire PTE who'd been in London at other meetings were actually severely disrupted in getting home because of the uh, fire being dealt with. But if you look at what happened thereafter, as you said, the results of Fennel impacted on TFL at all levels and could be seen to change the culture. But included within that culture was a director resigning, or perhaps even being asked to resign, um, and other members of staff leaving as well. Clapham was slightly different, because I think you said, you quoted the hours the technician had been working. What you didn't say was the technician, in fact, was also a member of British Railway's operational staff, uh, sorry, office staff, who worked with the maintenance teams and the renewal teams at weekends. And that was one of the serious lessons, I think, that mm -hmm. uh, came out of Clapham, that you've got to ensure that you know what your employee is doing without interfering with his personal freedoms or her personal freedoms. You've got to know what the, the employee is doing in order to satisfy yourself that he or she is actually going to be able to work safely. But I also know of Gordon Pettit, who was the general manager of the uh, southern region at the time. And I know that he did offer his resignation to mm -hmm. the chairman of the board. And the chairman of the board said no. He said, I know that you understand you've been to the funerals, you have talked to the families. He said, I, I know how this has deeply affected you. You feel responsibility. I do not believe you are responsible, but I do believe you are somebody who can help us to learn the lessons out of this. And that was, that was rather different, and, and it perhaps means that the national politicians were not exercising quite such a close influence on British Rail as were being uh, exercised within London at the time. But I'd be very interested to know how you felt the means of changing the culture were either similar or different in both organisations. Thanks, John, and I'll uh, accept that quibble. Um, you could have quibbled with worse, I'm sure, so <laughs> I'll take that. Um, you're absolutely right. There's, I, I won't be able to speak to some of the, the historical change and culture um, 
I have no ex I have experience of the TFL and the LU perspective, but not of the, the, the kind of British Rail of the time. Culture will often be influenced by the individuals who are involved um, and those in the positions of power at the time or position of influence. And you st like, I mean, we see it around us still where you have people who take the issue and deal with it, but it becomes so ingrained into an organisation. And I suppose the, the shockingness of the, and the horror, as you described, of King's Cross uh, perhaps because of what I described, how the underground is really part, such a part of London, it felt very real to people. I sometimes joke, when I joined TfL, I feel like I was chipped on day one. One moment I'm a member of the, like, the travelling public, next day I feel like I'm chipped, and you know, this is what, you know, it's a real part of you. And I don't know how, whether the, the, there was that element of personal accountability that really comes across um, very early on. So I don't, I don't know the answer to your question about why the culture in one organisation changes but not in another. Um, some of it may be just to do, do with the, it's, you know, the, the London Transport, the kind of, it's based in a, a single regional area. And I often think that it's easier sometimes for us to make changes within TfL because, you know, I, very, you know, I rarely have to go outside the M25, but, you know, if you're trying to change something across the entire country, it's just harder, you know? So there's that element of just geographical distribution. But there's also something I think about um, an organization and how it thinks about corporate memory. And, you know, as we started, we, you know, we reinvigorated our attention on fire uh, about four years ago, about that. And <coughs> we re that's when we realized that some, a number of people just did not understand what King's Cross was short for. You know, they didn't understand the shorthand. Uh, and re so we, you know, we reviewed the 157 recommendations in the final report with the fire brigade, line by line, to see what we've kept, what we've changed. Some of the things have evolved since then. Um, we have gotten rid of the uh, recommendation which says that the hierarchy or the seniority of staff should be very clearly um, distinguishable in what they're wearing. Um, we've now much more focused on who is the right person to be bronze, silver, or gold control for uh, an incident. But I suppose there's a, an element of that. And do you know what? I think it's quite an, I work quite closely with the uh, network rail team, my counterparts there. And I think you might have just triggered a conversation I'll have with them, which is where do we, where have we most effectively changed culture? What has allowed that? And what has sustained it? So yeah, so I don't have an answer, but maybe next time I come, I'll, I'll have more, I'll have put more thought into it. Okay, anybody else want to? One second behind you uh, first to Richard. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a, a fascinating talk. I, I'm not professionally involved in the railways, but I do read all the RAIB reports and I find them very interesting and they have parallels for other industries as well. I think two things that seem to come out to me from a lot of them are around human factors. Mm -hmm. One is, you talked about the word culture in the context of the organisation, but in a number of recent incidents, it's been around the culture of small work groups where there's a team of people who perhaps work together every day, are socialised together as mm -hmm. well, and Spanish practices start to come in, and the more junior in the structure perhaps don't challenge the more senior because of the friendships and the dynamics mm -hmm. of the group. Uh, that, that's one area. The other is the problems that occur because of vacancy gaps. The number of reports I've read recently where planning mistakes or things have not been picked up in planning work because the person doing covering the job is maybe trying to cover two roles, mm -hmm. there's been a vacancy for a long period of time. And I, I suspect that TfL has a similar problem, that you have unfilled posts. Mm -hmm. How do you manage those two issues, the culture within groups and the danger that because of vacancies, people are under undue pressure and therefore make mistakes or don't spot things which they might have been able to spot if they weren't yeah. under that pressure? It's very true. Culture isn't just about, you know, what the, what the person at the top says. 
they do have a role to play, but culture is, it's both bottom up as well. And the way that we are trying, because we will have similar issues, I mean, you have teams that work together for years in some of these teams, and they know each other well, they've been to each other's weddings and godparents to their kids and so on. It's about, the way that we, I suppose the way that I think that we do it is we tackle it via, via different topics. So I touched about, um, one of my slides at the end there was about operational communications, so what we used to be called safety critical comms. Now we changed process and standards and systems for that, but we talked about it as a culture change and we talked about it as teams having standards that they work to and having pride in those standards. Because it's really hard to change the culture of a team. But if I can change the culture of how they communicate, that then allows me in a number of years to change the culture of some another part of that risk. So you do it in stages rather than saying, this year we're going to change the culture of our small teams. And we found that when we approached changing how we dealt with operational communications, um, safety critical communications, based on the theory that, you know, any operational communication can be safety critical. So we don't just train them for that, we train them for the entire lot. So we, we do a lot of why now. So if I think about fire training, if I think about communication training, we talk a lot about the whys of it. We don't talk, we're very good at teaching people what to do. Check this fire control panel, here's the rules about comms. But we do a lot more now in the training about the why it's important. And then we talk to our teams about the standards that we expect out of them. So we find that they begin to hold each other to higher standards and come up with ways of holding each, each themselves to standards. And so, you know, we, we, I begin to see that from the teams. But I think it's bite size because I think that you, it's really hard to go in and say, I will change the, the culture of a team. What you can do is ra raise the standards and the expectation and the pride a team has in doing something. We do do a lot of sharing um, from key other uh, investigations. Um, you know, we talked to all of our teams who access track after the Margam um, fatalities and really started drilling out into, you know, what we call safety conversations. You know, do you think this could happen in your environment? Why? Why not? What if? Um, and, of course, with all of that goes, you know, fair culture, you know, open and honest reporting. And that big framework helps. But I find that if you give people something solid and tangible where you're saying, we're going to improve the culture on this, it slowly and incrementally begins to change other cultures. And going to your second question about vacancy, yep, you're absolutely right. There are, organ, there are gaps in a number of teams around uh, in TFL, and we've certainly been hit by some of it recently when we've been through such an uncertain period. So here the answer is a mixture of a number of things. You know, that, uh, because it's not just uh, vacancies. The other thing I would add to that is when we have very big projects or any projects where people are trying to do the right thing and get something across the line, you know, time gets squeezed and people are asked to do more in a shorter period of time. So the, kind of the basis for a lot of things is being trying to be really open and honest and talking about those sort of issues because that element of people being squeezed for time came up in one of our own internal investigation reports last year. Being really open and honest and talking about it and saying this is the pressure that we're putting under, people under. But it's also looking at it from the end. If I understand what the risk is, so if I understand the risk of fire, what are all the things that can contribute to fire? Of course I want to know how many fires we've had, track stations, etc. But you choose about what you monitor. So if I, for example, one of the things that we're, one of our top risks is safe access to track. One of the things we monitor is the amount of notice we give to the teams before they go on track. So if I can track that that's deteriorating, that tells me I need to intervene. And this is something that I share with the TFL operations leadership team. So it's about choosing very carefully what are the key things you should monitor and that will tell you when your performance is deteriorating. So you don't, yes, you encourage open and honest reporting, but you also have checks and balances, which mean that you understand whether performance is, is getting better or worse and that you can react early enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nick, thank you for waiting. The mic will come to you now. This is a question that's somewhat specific, but you may or may not be able to answer, and don't feel embarrassed if you <laughs> are. Um, I noticed one of your images was, was an S-stop sitting at Baker Street with blue LED lighting on the interface. 
I may not notice it now, but has that been discontinued? Was, was it something that worked or didn't work? I can tell you lots about blue lights at Baker, Baker Street. So when we introduced the SDOC, um, the, as you may know, the SDOC uh, is designed to be level with the platform. Right. And that works generally, re obviously, to help you know, accessibility. Our job is to make it easy for people to travel around London. So if you've got an ex you know, a train that comes in at the same level as the platform, happy days for most people. There are 35 locations across the underground where because of the curved nature of the platform, when the train comes in, that the gap is wider than it was prior to the instant, prior to the introduction of the SDOC. Uh, we've been tackling how do we manage the risk of falling, somebody falling down between the train and the platform at these 35 platforms. And some of them, uh, the risk is higher than others. Baker Street Platform 2 is, one of, is our top uh, platform risk for people falling down that gap, wider gap because of the SDOC. So we've done a lot of work of it. And one of the things that we trialled, and here is something, actually we were talking about this um, with, earlier this week, no, today's only one day, so it must have been today, uh, at work today, the element of, with safety, you cannot be afraid to fail in some of the things you try. Because if you're only going to ever try the things that you know are going to work, that, you know, you're not going to tackle the things that aren't going to, that, that might not work, and you won't, it won't unlock what you need. So when we looked at the uh, uh, Baker Street, we started looking at a variety of things, you know, gap fillers, um, uh, signs in the platform, announcements, changes to the, uh, to the trains. And one of the things we thought was, if we push this blue light, so when the train comes in, blue light under the platform, when the train comes in, it would shine against the side of the platform, a pl side of the train, reflect, and it would draw attention to our, the gap for the customers. What we realised, it didn't help at all. We trialled it for a period of time. And we were thinking, if it was going to work, you know, it's actually a relatively straightforward fix. Mm. So if it worked, we thought, this is great. We can roll it out in loads of locations. It didn't make any real change. So, and this is where I think it's really important that you look at something and you say, we trialled it, it didn't work. You write down all the reasons it didn't work. You say, here is the data and here's the evidence base. So that you don't have somebody in three years' time saying, do you know what, I've got a great idea. Um, but it, it, for me, so it, yes, that's, that's why it was removed. Um, it's why we haven't rolled it out more widely. But for me, it's also beyond a lesson in what works and doesn't work. It's a really important element of not being afraid to try something. People are afraid sometimes with safety for trying something in case it doesn't work and it might be perceived that they've made things worse. We can't be afraid to try things because we won't learn and grow without that. Sure, thank, thank you very much. Right, is there another question anywhere? We'll give it a few more seconds in case, but we won't milk it, so I think that's it, Marion. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much indeed. Um, I mean, I'll say two things by way of summary at the end. The first, perhaps rather obvious, I think that was a truly remarkable presentation. There are lots of positive words I could use. It was topical, it was relevant, it was thought-provoking, but a really excellent presentation on the subject, and thank you for that. But I think the other thing I take away is quite frankly, that seemed to me to come from the heart. And for those of us in the audience like me, who can remember some of these things from our London transport career, that I find it reassuring that the lessons which perhaps in our day had not been learnt, quite clearly now seem to have been learnt. And I do find that very reassuring. And thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you one and all. Uh, see you back here in a month's time or Acton if you want to come and hear about uh, underground trains again.